Another constraint-based approach, which is especially useful when it comes to the simulation of mammalian cells or plant cells or in general for the cells for which uh, we do not have a well-defined objective function is known as sampling-based flux balance analysis. Here, there is no need to define an objective function. For the microorganisms, it is well proven that they try to maximize their growth, but we cannot use this as an objective function when it comes to mammalian cells, for example, mammalian organisms. So this is uh, an obstacle indeed to, ap to, to apply FBA to uh, higher order organisms. With this sampling based FBA, we don't need to define an objective function, so that makes life easier for FBA based mammalian cells. I have just made this point now. Sampling based FBA is again a constraint based analysis. So we still have the constraints mass balance constraints, measurement constraints, or reversibility constraints for the reactions. Those constraints are defined, and then the solution space is randomly sampled for many, many times, about 1,000 times. So you have a solution space. Let's say this is the solution space. And we don't know the objective function. So the solution space is randomly sampled to get many, many flux distribution that corresponds to each point. And usually for the sampling based FBA, we have two conditions to compare. Let's say this is uh, for aerobic growth. Or since we are talking about higher order organisms, let's give more realistic example. Let's say this is normal cells. And here we have another state, which is hypoxic cells. So the condition where the oxygen is not, uh, the oxygen levels are not enough. So here we have a different solution space. And again, the solution space is sampled randomly. Thousand times. And for each reaction, their distribution here versus their distribution here is compared. So rather than comparing a single flux, the histograms of the fluxes across those thousand different vectors are compared here. The important point here is the solution space in terms of the, the shape can be very uh, complex for the uh, systems with a lot of unknowns for genome scale models, for example. So you need to make sure that your random sampling is homogeneously sampling the solution space. What I mean is, if this is the solution space, and if with your sampling you are always getting sample points from this corner, and you are not sampling the other parts, then this does not reflect the true behavior of your solution space. So you need to use algorithms that make sure that they sample all parts of the solution space and homogeneously. Of course, this would also be problematic. Maybe you have samples from everywhere, but most of the samples lie just on this corner, a lot of them. That's not a homogeneous spacing. So in order to better characterize the solution space behavior, 
you need to homogeneously sample the solution space in both cases that you want to compare. So then you can understand how the solution space has changed from condition one to condition two, and how this solution space change affected the uh, flux behavior. For this homogeneously sampling uh, thing, the common algorithm is called hit and run sampling. And this algorithm is available in the Cobra toolbox. So there is a function sample CB model, which takes the model as an input. And then you can specify how many times you want to sample the solution space. There are a couple of other uh, options you specify those options, then at the end, after you run this function, you will get, for example, 1000 uh, different flux vectors as an output. Cobra nicely has test functions, so you can uh, use those test functions to see how the functions work. Uh, so you can write test sample CB model, press enter, and then uh, this will call model its application to an already available uh, metabolic network in the Cobra toolbox. So you will see automatically the results and you will get a view of how the algorithm works, what kind of results it generates. Uh, so initially, when this uh, sampling-based algorithms were uh, introduced, the first papers used Monte Carlo sampling, but this is uh, this only works for small dimension problems. Uh, I won't go into details, but uh, today's standard is hit and run sampling. I will just uh, tell you how hit and run sampling works. Let's say this is our solution space. Okay. First, we choose a point or a flux vector which we know lies inside the solution space. So here this is a point, but actually it represents a flux vector for that specific uh, point in the solution space. So uh, for hit and run sampling, first we choose a flux vector which we know lies inside the solution space. Then hit and run sampling generates a random direction passing through this point within the solution space. In the third step, it chooses a random point on the chosen direction. Let's say it has chosen this one. Then in the next step, another random direction is generated, this time passing through the, the new point. Then using this new direction, we select the next sampling point. So it should lie on the chosen direction. We choose it randomly, such that it will be stay still in the solution space. So we will choose a random point from this direction now. And we repeat this till we collect enough number of points, let's say 1000. So again, now a random direction will be chosen such that it will pass through this new point. Again, a random point will be chosen from this direction. And again, a random direction this time will pass through this point. A random sampling point will be taken, etc., etc. This will lead to homogeneous sampling 
of the solution space. As you see, we have random selected points everywhere in the solution space. The procedure is repeated until we have the desired number of sample points. The key point here is, remember I have told you that the solution space indeed is not this simple. If it was this simple, you can just easily uh, homogeneously sample the solution space. But the shape of the solution space can be much more complex. So, for example, the shape can be something like this. Um, so, if you choose a point here, if you choose random directions, you, you may get just stuck in this point because it's a narrow point. So, it would take a while to switch to somewhere here. Therefore, the sample CB model in COBRA does not record every succeeding generated point. To uh, make sure that we really get homogeneously spaced uh, samples uh, as an output. So this is the parameter available in a sample CB model. Usually a number of hundred or thousand is used. So this means that start generating your um, points. So record this one. And if n is hundred, start keep generating random points. Each point corresponds to a flux distribution. But don't record them until you generate the 100th point. So then you will make sure that you are not stuck in the original position. So with 100 times changing in the direction, probably you will now switch to somewhere here. Again, you record this. You run the algorithm. Again, you don't record the next 99 generated points. You record the 100th one. So in this case, if you want to generate 1000 flux distribution, you are actually generating 100,000 flux distributions because you will just uh, record every hundred of them. So this is the function in COBRA. You will enter uh, the model name as input. Currently, there are two, I think, two different algorithms uh, that implement hit and run sampling in COBRA. So you can choose which one you would like to use. And there is this options parameter. So this is the parameter that I have just talked about. Which step, which which is the number of steps to be taken to record a point? So if you set this to thousand, thousand points will be generated, and then uh, the last one will be recorded. Another thousand points will be generated randomly. The again, the the last one will be uh, recorded, etc. And this is the number of points to be returned. So how many flux distributions you want? You can set this to 200, 5,000, 2,500, sorry, not 100, 5,000, 10,000. Uh, of course, it will take some time. Computationally, it's not that easy because you're generating so many different fluxes, right? So many different flux vectors. Uh, but around 1,000 flux vectors can be enough to make the comparison. This is one of the first papers uh, available in literature that utilized sample-based flux balance analysis. It was published in Journal of Biological Chemistry. The paper is again from the uh, Bernard Parsons group, 
remember he was a pioneer when it comes to constraint based analysis methods he is a pioneer and uh, in this paper they have analyzed metabolic network states of human mitochondria and they have analyzed impact of diabetes ischemia the lack of oxygen and diet and in their work since uh, this is human uh, mitochondria uh, in some cases in literature for the simulation of mitochondria ATP maximization is used as an objective uh, because we know that mitochondria is the the energy source so it is safe to use I ATP maximization as the objective function well, on the other hand you know we have those diabetes ischemia cases so maybe the mitochondrial behavior is different in those cases so to make a fair comparison they have used a sample based flux balance analysis in their work so for each mitochondrial flux reaction, they have generated uh, a lot of flux values. They have used histograms to make the comparisons. So to implement those ischemic or uh, dietary conditions, they have changed the glucose uh, or uh, fat uh, related fluxes here for example let's look at this one this is the uh, profiles for extracellular oxygen uh, utilization so in the normal physiological conditions if you plot a histogram of all those thousand values for the oxygen uptake rate this is the profile if you plot it for the low fat high glucose simulations this is the profile if you plot it for high fat low glucose case this doesn't show any variability almost these are the profiles so by comparing those histograms you can say that yes this specific reaction is affected between the two conditions because they have uh, noticeably different histograms. In this case, for example, we don't see any major difference between the extracellular uh, proton flux levels, but uh, or, or here, for example, this distribution is within the bigger distribution. Again, we don't see very clear separation, but for some cases, as you see here, you see the clear separation. So in this way, without using the objective function, you can characterize the effects on the fluxes. Uh, 